here we go. Hello, everybody. Good morning. It is a beautiful fall morning out there. Um, and we are delighted to have you here for uh, another edition of Virtual Classics for Kids with Worcester Public Library. Um, now, this morning, we have a returning performer. Um, Anne Elise Kiefer was actually, um, Anne Elise and Allison were our last performers in the live version of this series um, earlier this year. We had a great time with them um, hearing some flute and harp. Uh, pieces in the borough at Whistler Public Library, and we're really delighted to have Annalise back for its solo performance um, in the virtual version of our uh, of our program. Now, um, just to let you know, folks, if you are watching on Facebook, hello, thanks for being here. Um, we are delighted to have you here, and we will be taking questions from you. Um, however, we're going to ask that you hold them until the end of Annalise's performance. So she has um, a set prepared um, and she will be telling you a bit about the many flutes that she's playing today. Um, so you're going to hear a little bit about the pieces and about the different instruments she's playing. Um, and then after her set is done, we will be delighted to take your questions. So we hope you really enjoy this performance. Um, I am going to mute myself and hand it over to Annalise. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me today. Um, and I'd like to thank the Whistler Public Library uh, and Jeanette in particular for hosting this program today. It's been a great opportunity to be able to perform during COVID. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm going to be presenting a family of flutes. Uh, I have called the program a fleet of flutes because it's sort of like a huge number of ships heading out to sea. Um, this family of flutes consists of 11 flutes today and five different fingering systems. So I was saying to Jeanette earlier, it's kind of like um, speaking five different fairly closely related languages, like maybe German, Dutch, Norwegian, Swedish, um, and Danish. Um, and they're close enough to get you horribly confused, but, um, but well worth the effort because they're such wonderful instruments. <clears throat> the flute is a delightful instrument to play if you've been thinking of maybe uh, taking up an instrument or maybe going back to flute if you played it uh, when you were younger. Uh, it's very small, it's very portable. Uh, in fact, I've spent most of my life traveling from one place to another with at least one flute at all times. Um, it's a really great, uh, kind of an instrument to play. And as you will find out from today, there's lots of different varieties of flute to play from all around the world. And just in the Western European tradition, there's also a huge number of historical flutes that you can play that will give you a lot of pleasure. Um, the flute is uh, thought to be the oldest instrument for which we have any kind of archaeological evidence. And in fact, the oldest one was found in a cave in Germany um, it was made from the wing bone of a bird, and it was, you won't believe this, 43,000 years ago. That, to give you an idea, that's about 10, whoops, oops there goes a Chinese flute. <laughs> um, to give you an idea, that's 10,000 years before people started painting on the walls and the ceilings of caves. And I don't know about you, but I've always wondered if they got in trouble for that. I wonder if somebody said, hey, stop painting buffaloes and horses on the cave. Do you realize somebody's got to clean that off? Um, so I won't be playing anything that's 43,000 years old today. Um, probably the oldest kind of flute that I'll be playing will be the Chinese flutes that I'll start with. Um, I will play a flute today that is actually 160 years old, but the other ones are replicas of earlier flutes. So I'm going to start with the Chinese flutes. Um, they're very finicky. They're very demanding. Uh, they insisted on going first. They're like little kids. Um, and they're nerve wracking because they uh, are very temperamental. <laughs> the, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me. the Chinese flute is just a very, very basic uh, tube of bamboo. Um, and it's like the early European flutes that you would have seen in the Renaissance and early Baroque up until the kind of late 1600s. It's just a tube with a hole that you blow into 
and the six finger holes. But the Chinese flute is different because it's got a membrane up here, which makes a buzzing sound. Um, that's, it, it makes a buzzing sound if you're lucky. Unfortunately, sometimes when it makes a lovely buzzing sound, the flute doesn't really work. And sometimes when the flute works, it doesn't make a lovely buzzing sound. These flutes are played quite differently from the, uh, the, the concert flute. For one thing, we hold our hands sort of like a couple of cranes that are facing each other or storks that are facing each other. We lift our fingers very high. We don't use our tongue to, um, to articulate the way we do on the modern flute. If we want a vibrato, we take the flute and we jiggle it from side to side. Of course, it makes this buzzing sound. Um, and the, it has ornamentation, little trills and little fiddly bits that are a lot like bagpipes or even like Baroque music, early um, music from the 16 and 1700s. We also do these sort of slides with our fingers. Um, you'll notice that these flutes have got a tassel on the end and that's just to kind of add to the kind of graceful effect of the person playing. So the first flute that I'm gonna play, I'm just gonna use a little bit of spray to see if I can help the membrane to buzz. This first piece is called Lady Meng Jiang. It's um, a Jiangsu folk song from China. And it's about a lady who's very sad because her husband has just been forced to go to the Great Wall and work on the Great Wall of China. is on the most finicky of my flutes. Um, this is just a little uh, folk song, again, from the area called Jiangsu in China. Um, and it's called Perpetual Spring. again. The next piece I'm going to play is called Su Wu Tens Sheep. It's a very ancient Chinese melody.
final piece I'm going to play for you is from the Shanghai Opera. It's called Purple Bamboo Melody. <clears throat> a very uh, technologically simple Chinese flute. I'm now going to get up and get my modern concert flute, which is very, very different. This flute um, has changed very little since the middle of the 1800s. Um, that would be uh, 10, 15 years before the uh, Confederation of Canada, before we were even a country. This particular flute is made of solid uh, 14 karat gold and it has silver keys. You'll notice immediately that it's a much, much louder sound. Um, this flute uh, has an elaborate key system. So when I press one key, it'll make other keys go up and down at the same time. Um, it's got a beautiful sound, but it's also very loud. It's used for solo work and for playing in an orchestra. Uh, and you'll notice in comparison with some of the other flutes I'll play today, it's way louder. It's also very even, and it's quite simple to play in different keys, just the way you could on a piano. The white keys and black keys are the same. Whereas on some of the instruments I'll play today, that really makes a difference what key you're in. Um, the piece I'm going to play today is called Tuan Yan. It is celebrating a festival in China that's held every May the 5th, and it commemorates a defeated army that decided to uh, jump to their death uh, rather than submit to military defeat. Uh, you'll notice that this has got a lot of Chinese sounding themes in it. Um, and it also has a lot of different sections, some of which might make you want to jump up and dance a little bit, and that's fine.
is how the modern flute sounds. Um, and now I'm going to take you way back to about 300 years to hear how flutes sounded in the early 1700s, even the late 1600s. So this is the Baroque flute, sometimes known as the Traverso. This flute is made of boxwood with ivory keys. Um, it has just six holes for the fingers plus one key. This is the flute that uh, would be used for pieces written by Bach or by Handel or Telemann or Vivaldi. The flute was originally um, sort of like a Chinese flute. It was just a cylinder up until the late 1600s. And then in France, designers started to make flutes that were more like this, which actually taper down to the bottom. Um, this flute is very quiet. Um, because it only has one key, we have to use these things called cross fingerings, which is similar to what we do on the recorder. Um, and the flute is happiest in simple keys in sharps. It doesn't like flats at all. Um, and it's very challenging to play due to the problems with tuning. And also with the cross fingering, sometimes the notes are very quiet. This piece I'd like to play for you is called Les Folies de, de Spagna. It's written uh, by a French composer called Marin Marais, who was a famous um, soloist on a, an instrument sort of like an early cello called the viola da gamba. Um, La Folia was a melody that was very popular throughout Europe and used as a theme for many themes and variations. So today I'm gonna to play for you the theme and seven variations. And you'll notice this flute is much, much quieter than the flute I just played. <laughs>
sounded like up until pretty much the late 1700s and you're probably surprised at how quiet it actually is. The next flute I'm going to play for you is made of different kind of wood. It's very very similar. It's a bit louder and it makes a bit of a clearer sound. This is the flute that would have been used um, at the time of uh, probably late Haydn, Mozart, early Beethoven. Again, it just has one key, but it's quite a lot louder. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to be playing for you a piece that would have been from the time that this flute was being used. This is by Mozart. Uh, it is a little arietta out of a very popular opera called The Abduction from the Sorelio. Uh, I will be playing the short little melody and three variations on the classical flute. Thank <laughs> you. 
gives you a bit of an idea of the flute that Mozart, Beethoven, uh, Haydn were actually writing for, and it gives you an appreciation for how difficult so much of that music actually is on the original instrument. Now I'm going to get uh, an instrument for you that was the final flute before the revolu revolutionization of the key system. This is the eight key flute. So uh, during the late 1700s, uh, during Mozart's life and just after he died, um, the flute builders were gradually adding more and more keys to the flute. Um, and eventually by uh, the, about 1830, 1840, it had eight keys. Um, so this is the flute that would be the last one that was played before the modern key system was introduced. Um, this has been my COVID-19 project. I started it during the lockdown, so I'm really still something of a beginner on this flute. Um, it's a very tricky flute to play. Um, you can ignore the keys and play it just like a Baroque flute, just like the flute I just played, the two flutes I played. Um, but the keys add real complexity so that when you play a particular note, you have to decide, is it, am I playing it as a sharp or as a flat? Because those are different, those are different fingerings. Um, and also for some notes, you might have three or four different choices of fingering, whether you use the keys or use this key or use that key. So it's really quite a complicated instrument. Um, I'm going to play for you a little piece uh, called The Last Rose of Summer, which is a little Irish folk song. It was written by Kulau, um, this particular uh, set of variations. So I'm going to play the theme and three variations. I just need to make sure the setup's okay because I only have one head joint for the flute that I just played and for this flute. So I just had to add that head joint onto this flute. So this is the eight keyed flute. <laughs>
So uh, I'm now going to bring out the flute that came immediately after this flute, and you'll see there's an enormous difference between the two. So if you compare these two flutes, you, you can see that something pretty major happened in the middle of the 1800s. And um, this is what happened. Uh, a very fine uh, jeweler and goldsmith called Theobald Boehm um, went on a trip to London. He was a very fine um, flute player himself, and he wrote quite a lot of good pieces for the flute as well. And he went to hear um, a very famous uh, flute soloist in London called Charles Nicholson. And this gentleman uh, played the flute beautifully and with a huge sound. And he was noted all around Europe for this enormous sound that he made on what basically quite a quiet instrument. So Boom has to see his flute and he saw that this gentleman had taken the holes that you um, put your fingers on and he gouged them out so there were huge holes. And I, presumably he had very big fingers. And this is how he made this enormous sound. So Boom decided, well, I wanna have an enormous sound too, but I don't have ginormous fingers, so what am I gonna do? So he decided, what if I were to have huge holes but cover them with keys. Uh, and then he started to realize, well, I don't actually have enough fingers to cover all these keys. So he came up with this mechanism whereby you can press one key and it makes other keys go up and down at the same time. Uh, so he experimented between 1832 and 1847, and he eventually came up with the modern key system uh, he had quite a few different kinds, and this is one of the kinds that he came up with. This is quite different from the fingering for the modern flute. Uh, so this has been quite a challenge because it's very, very confusing. Um, <clears throat> uh, he did um, manage to um, sell the contract or his, um, his um, basic uh, design for making the mechanism to a company in London called Rudel Cart, and they mass produced flutes all around the world and they were probably the most famous flute makers at that time. I looked up on their website and it said that before the First World War they had 118 different models of flute available. Um, this flute I acquired when I was a teenager in London I tried it a couple of times and I thought, mm, this is too hard. And so I didn't touch it for years and years. Um, and just, uh, just a couple of years ago, I picked it up and had it completely rebuilt. It had been covered in cracks. Um, I initially thought that this flute was from maybe the, um, I don't know, 1930s or something. And it turns out that this flute actually was built in 1860. So it's 160 years old. Um, it's got the most beautiful sweet sound and uh, it just kind of takes you back to um, just the earliest of the boom flutes. This in fact was built 13 years after the key system changed. So I'm gonna play for you um, a, a very famous tune called the Carnival, Carnival of Venice plus three variations. Um, for the flute, we've got two other versions of this. And what I find fascinating is this is written by a man called Henry Nicholson and I haven't been able to find out if he was the son of that famous British player. He was undoubtedly in the same family, though. <clears throat>
Well, I just hope I can perform that well when I'm 160 years old. Um, the next flute that I'm going to play for you uh, is a ginormous flute. It's going to make me look like I just shrank. I look smaller now, don't I? <laughs> this is called the alto flute. And interestingly enough, um, Theobald Böhm, who redesigned the entire key system for the flute, also designed this flute. Um, he designed a flute that was going to be four notes lower than the modern flute and significantly bigger and wider. Um, and so it has a huge low register, big loud sound on the bottom, but it's a little bit fuzzy on the top. And it's the opposite to the piccolo, which I will play next for you, which has got a beautiful clear upper register, but is a bit fuzzy on the bottom. Um, so when Bum designed this flute, he uh, designed it with the same range as the violin. And his hope was that it would compete with the violin as a solo instrument because it had the same range. And clearly that hasn't happened because probably none of you've ever seen one of these giants before. Um, this flute was very popular with French composers like Debussy and Ravel in their orchestral pieces. And it's heard a lot in commercials, especially ones with um, toilet tissue and fluffy white kittens. <laughs> and, and it's also in a lot of movie scores like the Harry Potter movies. So um, I've enjoyed during COVID, I've been playing a lot of the um, unaccompanied uh, suites for violin and cello by Bach. I think they work really well on this instrument. And today I'm gonna to play for you uh, a corante from the cello suite in num number one. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I really can't fit this all into the screen. <laughs> You're gonna to have to just imagine it. <laughs> And now for the final selection, I'm gonna play the orchestral piccolo. Uh, this is going from the lowest instrument we normally play to the highest instrument we normally play. The piccolo has been in use since the late 1700s in uh, symphonic and opera music. And in fact, it uh, has a very, uh, important role in the opera by Mozart, 
that I played you the little excerpt out of earlier on. I think, see, this is really, really tiny. This is one octave above the regular flute, and it can be a little bit loud, so I won't be at all hurt if you cover your ears. And in fact, because it's more blessed to give than to receive, I'm even going to wear some earplugs myself. <laughs> when we play the piccolo, we do have to protect our ears because it is quite loud, and if we play for many hours over many years, we can cause some damage. This piece is called Caprice en Gigue, and it's by a composer from the period of Bach, a German composer called Sebastian Bodinus. want to thank you very much for joining us today and I'd like to thank uh, Jeanette and the Whistler Public Library again. Thank you so much for hosting this event. I hope you've enjoyed meeting my flute family and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well I do have some questions for you Annalise. Um, I would like to say thank you to you also. That was so lovely. Um, entertaining and really informative. I, I learned a lot from you uh, over the last 45 minutes or so. Um, so uh, one question I have from, from myself um, is, and it's, it's, it's the kind of a comment, um, but maybe you'll have more information on it. It's about the Carnival of Venice. Is that the same tune as the children's song, My Hat, It Has, three corners. Do you know that song? Actually, I don't know the song. Um, this is, it's a very popular tune. Mm -hmm. um, and we have two very uh, commonly played versions of it. I only just discovered this. I just, I just picked up a pile of music that's been donated and I found it. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very amusing that it was written by the guy who was mm -hmm. a member of the family mm -hmm. of the famous soloist. Um, I, but I'm sorry, I don't know if it's related to that song at all. <laughs> well, I, I'll ask the audience if they know this song. Kids out there might know it. It's, it's a, at least I sang it when I was a kid. Um, you, you may, folks out at home, um, you may know the song. My hat, it has three corners. Three oh. corners has my hat. <laughs> oh, yeah, it sounds exactly like yeah, the same yeah. thing, for sure. I'll yeah. have to look into it and see, you know, 
clearly it was based on oh, on yeah. that song. <laughs> yeah, and it's also it's a really popular uh, song on the trumpet. There's a trumpet oh, version mm -hmm. of Carnival Venice mm -hmm. where they do really fast double twenty and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now I do have a question, um, and it involves a fancy word, uh, embouchure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you spoke a lot about different fingerings and different key systems. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk to us about how your embouchure changes from flute to flute. Um, well, it's just the, the hole between your lips is a little bit smaller for a tiny instrument like the piccolo or one of the smaller, like the, the little, um, the tinier flute, which is about the same, the Chinese flute is about the same as the um, piccolo. Mm -hmm. um, you, um, generally speaking, regardless of the size of the flute, you're covering a minimum of about a third to one half of the embouchure hole with your bottom lip. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps you to aim at that far side of the hole. That's the edge that you're blowing against. So mm -hmm. if you've ever mucked about in a restaurant and annoyed everybody and picked up a wine glass that's full of water. Uh, oh, no, sorry. That's a different form of annoyance. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> if you take a glass and you put it at a particular angle, you can actually blow on it and make mm -hmm. and make a um, a kind of a flute sound. So it's all about um, blowing at about a 45 degree angle to your body and the air that you are blowing is split on that edge. Mm -hmm. And that generates a little disturbance called an edge tone, uh, which then causes the sound in the flute. But yeah, on the different flutes, um, on the modern uh, metal flute, it's got a lip plate and on all these wooden instruments, there's nothing. So you have to kind of get used to where, where to put your lips. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, the tuning is much, much more demanding on the flutes that aren't modern. <laughs> um, and then within or using an individual uh, instrument, do the low notes or the high notes require more air from you? Um, you know, that's, that's a really tricky question. I'd say on something like the alto flute, you're really aware of having to blow a lot more air generally and a lot more for the lower notes. Um, the, uh, the frequency doubles with each octave and on the regular concert flute, we do have three octaves. So we're using faster air. I wouldn't say you'd necessarily use more air. I think it's probably more or less the same amount of air, just it's the speed of the air that we're generating. Mm -hmm. And that brings us back to the embouchure as well, that the hole between the lips will become a little bit smaller as you go higher on the flute. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's so much to think about. <laughs> oh, there, there is. <laughs> I'm mostly thinking about the, 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 the other side, the, just trying to not mix up the fingers. <laughs> um, now, another question for you, Annalise, about your, um, I guess, history playing flute. Um, we were wondering how, um, how you got into collecting all of these different flutes. How did you get interested in playing flutes from different parts of the world and different eras? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, I started it kind of late. I was actually 12. And for those kids who are out there, um, especially in the Suzuki flute method and even the color strings method, you can start at age four and five already on the flute. Um, it's a little flute, like a little candy cane, just so you know. Um, so I started as kind of a senior citizen at age 12. Um, and I fell in love with it really quickly, though I wasn't really good or anything, but I just, I just loved playing it. It was sort of my voice. Um, and then when I was, uh, I guess, a, a teenager, I was about 17, I went with my parents to London. That's where I acquired the alto flute and that historic uh, wooden flute that I just played, one from that's 160 years old. And I picked up some more historic instruments. Uh, and then each time I bought a new flute, I tended not to get rid of the old one. <laughs> I guess it's a kind of hoarding. Um, and then when I was kind of a, a teenager, I, I discovered various folk instruments and I would travel around with a bunch of them. Um, and then uh, when I was living in uh, Europe doing some studying after I finished my master's degree, I lived in uh, Europe and um, I had an opportunity to study the Baroque flute in Austria. So I went down there and I was able to snap up um, that first Baroque flute that I played. And then a few years later, I bought the, um, the, the classical flute as well as the eight-key flute. Um, alto flute is something that um, professional flute players generally have to have uh, because you might be hired to 
um, to use it for an orchestral piece like um, Daphnis and Chloe or something like that. Um, so most uh, professionals who are fairly busy would have an alto flute. Mm -hmm. um, I've got kind of a collection of piccolos. I play a lot of piccolo in the Vancouver Opera Orchestra. Um, so it's easy to kind of accumulate different piccolos. I have two head joints for that piccolo that I play. Um, and then uh, probably about 20 years ago, I played in Miss Saigon when there were a lot of um, uh, Broadway musicals coming through Vancouver. And the lady who was playing the four Chinese flutes for Miss Saigon kindly showed me how to play it and ordered me a set of flutes from Shanghai. And, um, and so I've just found it kind of fascinating because it's such a different kind of a tone quality. And I've played over the years, I've played various pan flutes and that kind of thing, although I'm even more of a beginner on a pan flute. <laughs> um, but it's just, uh, for me, playing the historical flutes is really, really fun because you feel like you're going through, um, it's sort of like in Star Trek where you go through a time tunnel to, pre to an earlier time and you hear, well, what did Bach hear in his head when he wrote for the flute? Or what did Mozart hear? Or what did Beethoven hear? Mm -hmm. I'm just very, very grateful to Boom that he came up with the key system because that eight key flute is just a killer to play. <laughs> so I assume that your alto flute, do you call the, the regular flute a soprano flute? I uh, know we just it, it just your concert flute I think concert flute so Part do the alto flute concert flute and piccolo all have that same modern key system yes they do yeah. okay there are, there are tiny, sometimes there are tiny discrepancies in fingering and the piccolo is a little less standardized than the flute flutes mm -hmm. have been built very very well especially in mm -hmm. the last 20 30 years they're very standardized they're very in tune piccolos are a little bit more wild um mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to hunt a little bit more for a good piccolo but yeah they're all they're all the same fingering thank the lord <laughs> now um we have a, another question that of course is always a popular question amongst kids but it's so hard to answer uh do you have a favorite i absolutely knew that question was going to come up <laughs> i think probably the concert flute that the, the the modern concert flute is probably my favorite, but I've got to say that I've really fallen in love with that uh, that wooden flute, that 160 year old flute. I, I find it just such a sweet sound. Um, I really, really enjoy playing it. But I think it, it also is maybe a little bit more dependent on the pieces. Like sometimes I'll play a broke flute or the classical flute and it's just so delightful to play it and I feel like I've been transported 300 years into the past so <laughs> it's a very difficult question to answer it's a great question though <laughs> mm -hmm. yes I mean and to be fair we're allowed to have uh different favorites for different circumstances right absolutely absolutely <laughs> I love playing the piccolo especially in some of those really fun sort of uh New Year's Day sort of uh, Strauss waltz and that kind of thing. It's just mm -hmm. so far. I love playing the piccolo too. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's like asking what your favorite composer is too. It's, it's a really <laughs> tricky question. Um, well, Annalise, before we sign off, I have a couple of other things to ask you about. Um, if somebody was wondering about flute lessons, mm -hmm. um, I hear you're doing Zoom flute lessons. Yes, I am. And, I, and I'm really enjoying them. Um, I teach for the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra School of Music um, and also for the Vancouver Academy of Music. And uh, both institutions are offering uh, lessons um, over Zoom. Um, and I'm happy to teach anybody who's interested. For the people who live in Whistler, when the, uh, when the uh, pandemic is over, I do spend half my week in Whistler and I'm happy to uh, to teach in person when uh, when it's safe to do so. Unfortunately, the flute is probably the worst offender when it comes to spreading aerosols. So we have to be, we're probably the last people who are gonna show up in person for <laughs> lessons. But yes, well, I'm happy to help anybody. And I've uh, taught everything from very, very advanced players to raw beginners. Uh, okay. and it's always a delight to uh, share my love for the instrument. Wonderful. So folks in the Sea to Sky corridor can sign up for virtual lessons. Um, and you would recommend going through the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra School of Music. Yes, that, that would be fine. Okay. Or the Vancouver Wonderful. Academy, either one. And in fact, anybody in the world can sign up for, mm -hmm. for lessons. Uh, if you can just find uh, something that works with the, the timing because it's over, uh, it, it's over Zoom, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, wonderful. And um, finally, I wanted to mention that um, if folks want to hear more of your music, there is a way to do so. 
Absolutely. Um, for the last uh, uh, sort of 15, 20 years, I've had two CDs on um, iTunes um, that you can download. Um, and for the people in Whistler, you're going to find this very amusing. The title for the um, two CDs is The River of Golden Dreams. <laughs> I came up here as a, a tourist many, many years ago, saw that sign for the river, and I thought, oh my God, what a great name for um, uh, a, a CD, particularly as I play a gold flute. So uh, that I, the subject, uh, the title came long before I actually recorded it. So I have those available as actual CDs for sale if anybody's interested, but but it's maybe more convenient just to download um, the various songs off iTunes. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, thank you again, Annalise. Uh, this has been an absolute delight. Um, I will, uh, I'll let the audience at home know that um, if you're interested in more classics for kids, we do have a session coming up in November. Um, uh, local um, viola player, Rebecca Smith, is going to be performing on November 24th. So it's another Tuesday, also at 11 a.m. on Facebook Live. Um, so I really hope that you'll tune in um, to hear Rebecca play her viola. She plays with the Sea to Sky String Orchestra. Um, and so we're really excited to host her for another virtual performance. But for now, we are going to say another big thank you to Annalise. Very, very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for joining in. Um, thank you, Annalise, again. And we are going to say goodbye to our friends on Facebook. Bye-bye. Thank you.